for this uh, morning, I'd like the church to open their Bibles in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10. I'd like to focus and I'd like to invite the church for a visual tour, an imaginary journey at the time of Jesus. We'll be going through some places, especially the roads, the dusty ways. We're going to imagine the encounters of Jesus with five groups of people that I would like you to understand and perhaps perceive that you might be able to relate to these encounters of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Are you all ready? How's the weather? Are we ready? I'm ready to take off. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are grateful for the seventh day Sabbath. Throughout the past six days, we're able to do our mundane things, our, our work, our school, our home. We have been on our phones, we have been on our computers, we have been meeting some of challenges in life. But today, I would like to lay all the electronics, lay all that distracts me from hearing the gospel, your encounters with this five group of people. Or people that are real 2,000 years ago and as we are real and relevant in our time today. Lord, allow our minds to see through the clarity of the message today. In the name of Jesus Christ, the soon coming King. Amen. Let me ask the kids, what do you want for Christmas? Or the kids. Let me ask the youth, what do you want for for Christmas? Let me ask the singles, what do you want for Christmas? Let me ask the married people, what do you want for Christmas? Let me ask the senior members of the church, what do you want for Christmas? I, I, you're not a senior member yet, Doc. I just, <laughs> the church. What do you want from Jesus? As we journey today, let's open our Bibles in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Please follow along with me as we journey towards the region of Judea. I happened to visit that place, uh, Bethany, and the other place, the opposite place where G, or the, 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 the place where Jesus would. Uh, make his most miracles or do his work in Capernaum. And then the the Bible will just give us the information, the other side. I don't know where that is, but the Bible gave us the, the, uh, the, uh, the idea that Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan. That's in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Mark. Are you following with me today? I will allow you... I will allow you to close your eyes because, as I told you, we are going into a visual, imaginary tour. You can close your eyes as I relate the story and narrative as faithful as I can. And if ever, because you close your eyes, you feel the, the nice, gentle, warm breeze inside a church and there's no dis- disturbance. Just don't make a sound. Five groups of people that Jesus encountered. And the question was, what do they want from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Are you ready? Verse 2. The Pharisees came and asked Jesus... Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What a question. And the next two words are very clear. Testing him. And so Jesus, as he was uh, gaining this 
this fame. He healed people. He's a great teacher. He's a respected rabbi. And he encountered this group of people. I would, I would just imagine the Pharisees. They are the defenders of the law. They are a party to be reckoned with. And they wanted to test Jesus. What do they want from Jesus, friends? At the outset of this sermon, I would like to begin by saying, in my mind's eye, the Pharisees would like verification from Jesus at least to discussion and then vindication of their position. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. If Jesus answered, yes, is it lawful to divorce his wife? You know, because that's the question. If Jesus said yes to the question, the Pharisees will think, Jesus, you are morally lax. You are not morally, uh, absolutely moral upright because you are saying that a man could divorce his wife. During that time, that was a very divisive issue. Nowadays, young people, it's not a very diverse, uh, diver, uh, divisive issue. The question today is, Pastor, could I marry... The same gender. That's the question for our discussion today. But during the time of Jesus, it was, can I divorce my wife? So if Jesus said yes, he will be liable in the minds of the Pharisees that he is morally lax. He is not absolutely moral, that he is not very conservative, that he is just, uh, you know, loose in his morals. And if he answers no... Then the Pharisees will say, you know what, Jesus, you, you reject the law of Moses because the law of Moses tells us it's okay to divorce your wife, dismiss her. The Bible says in verse 3, and he answered and said to them, I like, I like how, it, how this is being played out in the gospel of Mark. And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? Verse 4, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Listen carefully, friends, in the next verse, in verse 6. This is all what Jesus wanted them to hear. He did not say yes. He did not say no. He, he wanted to... Point them back, to point them back, ladies and gentlemen, children of God. He wants to point them back to the original ideal of God's creation between male and female. The design was for them to be together and that no man can separate. It's a tough question, right? Great answer, holy answer. Jesus pointed them, you know what? In the beginning, the original ideal of Jesus... Of oh, God, the creator God, is for husbands and wife to live together. Question. What do the Pharisees want from Jesus? They want verification, friends. They want to put Jesus in trouble. But Jesus no read their hearts. Jesus did not, did not, did not write along what they wanted Jesus to be in trouble. Jesus pointed them back to the original ideal. And so friends today, if you're having some troubles in your own marriage life, if you're having some troubles with your personal commitment, check out this. Jesus is pointing us back to the original ideal where why Adam and Eve were first created and why Adam was so lonely and Eve was, was fashioned according from his side, from his, from, from, from Adam himself to, to, to supplement, complement and to complete the man. Because God's ideal is for man not to be lonely, but for man to be complete. Amen? The second group of people. So uh, Jesus was there. And Jesus, you know, in the, in the rabbinical tradition, they would sit down as a teacher. You know, the sermon during that time, the message, nobody stands. They sit down. That's how they teach. It's just that now that we are standing. So Jesus was... In his rabbinical mode. And the second group of people. The parents brought their. Their children. It's amazing. I'm, I'm jumping now to verse 13. Of Mark chapter 10. The, then they brought little children to Jesus. That Jesus might 
touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when he saw the children, he was great. Uh, he, when he saw it, the situation, I mean, he was greatly displeased. So Jesus was greatly displeased. So for those of you folks who are greatly displeased sometimes with other people, don't feel so guilty. Jesus also was greatly, mega, displeased. Have you been displeased with other people who are annoying? Have you been? Could you nod your head? Are there people who are annoying? Yes? Are there people who irritate you? Is your... <laughs> yeah. Let me not say this. I'm very careful because we are live streaming. Jesus was also greatly displeased because the disciples were trying to rebuke the parents and their children to come to him. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Friends, what do the children, from the, the parents brought their children, what do the children want? The innocent people, the beautiful minds, the wonderful gift of God, the heritage of the Lord. What do they want from Jesus? If the Pharisees want verification, let me suggest that the children want benediction the word benediction is from the latin word two words beni and diction beni means well diction speak to speak beni diction to speak well of all the children wants to hear is that jesus will declare them that they are good that they are well isn't that a powerful powerful lesson for all of us friends our church needs benediction to, from each other if we speak well and declare by our words each other uplift us friends our church will be blessed i declare to you god's blessing you are good well god is good all the time you are you are I, looking good is that okay right i declare to you the words well words. Some people would say, you are awesome. Some people say, you are cool. I don't know why they liked it. You are chili. What I mean, chili is it's not the food, it's chill. Uh, chill. You know, chill. You're like, <laughs> what did I say, chili? <laughs> you know, they, they would say that, I, I, you know, I, I just hear this. What else are the cool words? Church, let me encourage you to declare good, good words to each other. You know, my, I heard, in order for a person to have a good mood from the home, he or she must hear some good words coming out of, of his or her house. My son, my daughter, today, I tell you, you are intelligent. You are smart. It's not a flattery or flabbergasting the child, right? You are, you are doing well. What will happen if you continue to declare to that child when he goes and goes to school? That child will, that child will, will assimilate, will absorb. You're not trying to flatter or not saying the truth. Child, you are the handsomest person in this world because you came from me. It's not flattery, it's true. In your eyes, in your own opinion, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. You are the handsomest or the most beautiful person. What am I saying here? What's the point? Instead of saying negative stuff, why don't you use benediction? Speak well of others. Oh, how's your pastor doing in the church? Ah, oh, our pastor is... What's that? What do you say when other people ask you... what? How is your pastor in the church? Or do you, you're just expecting, <laughs> you might say the, man, I tell you. <laughs> because you, let me tell you, what you say to other people about your church, your pastor, 
the other church members will determine if they would like to be here in the church or not. Are you with me, church? So you might be saying, how come, pastor, we are not growing? How come, pastor, people are, are not coming anymore here in the church? Check your words out, friends. You might be saying, you might be advertising, you might be marketing that this church is not that good. Because you're telling, oh, the pastor is no good or the, the elders are no good. Watch your marketing language. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, everybody? I'm talking to the church. If the church is not growing, check your benediction. Declare one another with affirmation from the Lord. There are people here who are coming from, the, from their homes that are so hurt. There are people here that are coming from their homes that are so misunderstood. And they are, they are judged. They feel that they don't have any. And when they come to church, they will hear those words. Friends, they want benediction just like kids. What do you want from Jesus? Do you want words of affirmation from you are my most high, you are my child, I will uphold you with my right hand, you are my beloved. Isn't that what we want to hear? Come on, friends, talk to me. So why don't we practice that? How's your pastor? How's your elders? How's your church? You're not just saying good or great. You're saying, you know what? We are so blessed. Declare words. Are you with me? Especially to your spouse. Every day, you know, I, we talk, right? You're not married. But every day when you have your girlfriend, or really you're when you get married, my friend, tell your wife-to-be, you are the most beautiful person in the world. Never miss that. So that it will, she will look beautiful. She will feel beautiful. She will try to be beautiful. She will shape up to be beautiful because you declared to her what you wanted to do in her life. Amen? Amen. Growing up, let me tell you this. Uh, my father said, I, I'm not really that good looking. I don't know why he said that. But my mom countered, son, you're the best looking guy. In the house. So she balanced. <laughs> what, well, why? It's serious. Uh, so the negative was, was also countered with the positive. I was doing a good grade. I was doing A's. Well, before it's not A's. It's um, what's our system there. We have grades like 95, 98. Yours is letter. So if I go home with my report card with a grade of 95 or 98, I would long to hear from my dad, son, you are a smart guy. My my dad would say, not not to defame, just, 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 just to state a fact. My son, when I was your age, I did 100. Could you relate to that? So I still strive. I'm not good enough. What am I saying here? I I still honor my dad. What I'm saying here, you declare to each other the benediction. Speak well of each other, friends. There are so many negative things that you could speak about with one another. But the Bible says the God, the children that, 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 that... the children that were brought by the parents, they want to hear good words from Jesus. And so the Bible continues to say in our narrative, friends, journey with me today as, as we read in verse 19, I, in verse 16, I'm, and he took them and Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on him and blessed them and spoke well. Do you speak well of your children? Children, do you speak well of your parents? Not flattery, not lies, but benediction. Speak well of others. In that way, people will be invited. When they're invited, oh, yeah, that's, you know the word of mouth? The word of mouth could give you a job or can stop you from finding a job. Does that make sense? That's why there's reference. Speak well. The third group of people. The heart of Mark chapter 10. Let me begin in verse 17. 
Now as Jesus was going out on the road, remember I told you from Judea, Jesus was walking along the dusty road. There were no cars during that time. There were no buses. There were donkeys and, and camels and, and people walked. That's why they look slim when you, when, you, when you watch the movies about Jesus. All of them are, are, are walking. Most of them are walking or riding a donkey or, or camel. And, and it's good for the heart. Remember, let's just a plug in because we're a fitness church. Walk. What did I say? Walk. When you go to the supermarket, park somewhere where you can walk around. Or probably when you go to the mall, not shopping, walk. Not just stop by. Because walking is good for us, friends. But that's not my message. The message is this. One unknown. One came running, not named. The person is an unnamed And we don't know. That's what I'm trying to say. Knelt before him and asked Jesus, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Gospel of Mark, uh, Matthew, the synoptic Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 to 22, has this view as well of that story. And he calls this young, this, this unnamed person in the, in the Gospel of Mark as rich. And Luke, Dr. Luke, in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 23, look at this, the same event, the same story. And he describes that this young is also a ruler or a prince or, or from a noble line or landowners, rich. So we have this understanding that this young man that Mark 10, verse 17 is talking about is the rich young ruler. But I would like to suggest to you, he is a millennial millionaire during his time. Not maybe the millennial, but I'm just using the words to make to give you an understanding of who this guy is. A pious Jew. He asked the right question. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Jesus did not deny. He, Jesus was just trying to let him understand that if you call me good, be sure you know who I am. I am the Son of God. And if there is only one good, so you're telling me I am God. You are right. I'm not denying it. But you have to be, you have to understand what you're saying. You know the commandments. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Number six, do not, do not murder. Eight, do not. Seven, six, eight, do not steal. Nine, do not bear false witness. Do not defraud according to some academics and scholars. It was inserted. Do not defraud. You cannot find that, but not find that. And number five, so six, seven, six, eight, nine, five. That's the order that Jesus used for the commandments, at least in the gospel of Mark. He missed out one thing. What's the problem of the, of the rich young ruler? Commandment number, let me suggest, 10. Do you know what's commandment number 10? What's commandment number 10? Huh? What is it? Uh, covet is a very highly biblical term. Another word for covet. Desire. You covet, you desire. What do you desire, young people? What a question. Listen to this narrative. I'm, I'm, I'm coming down so that I could talk to you. Talk to me as well through your imagination. Are you ready? And he answered and said to him, Teacher, Rabbi, all the commandments you mentioned, seven. What's the next six, eight, nine, five? I have kept them all very sincerely. I have been trained. I have been molded by my parents to honor those commandments. Instead of understanding that he called Jesus good, now he's shifting. He is saying that he is good because he kept the commandments. Are you following me? 
He's now shifting his, his statement. Remember, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Now, through his words, he was caught between the lines that he was the one, he's the one promoting himself that he is good. Dishonesty. What you say is not what you really feel or what you behave. Jesus then looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. You read it. And this is my point. Listen, are you ready? Those who are closing their eyes, you can now open your eyes. Look at me face to face. Be brave. Christ Object Lessons, page 172. The lover of self is a transgressor of the law. Let me repeat this. Let me repeat this so that I could understand. That you could understand. Ladies and gentlemen, children of the Most High God, lover, the lover of self, The rich young ruler was sincere. He kept the commandments. Seven, six, uh, seven, what else? Six, eight, nine, five. He kept all of this. This is relational. But one thing he did not keep, uh, the heart problem is what he will, he did not keep. Jesus saying, the lover of self, covetousness is a sin against your own heart. Because the plan of heaven is to give. Oh, I thought you didn't catch it. The character of heaven is to give. The rich young ruler wants to keep. What do this guy want from Jesus? Let me suggest. He wants information. The Pharisees wants verification. The children wants benediction. The rich young ruler wants information. What is information? We have a lot of information. But if that information does not change you, what good it is? And so the Bible says here in the, in the climax of the story, in, in, in the last few verses, this is, what, this is what the account of Mark is saying to all of us. And I'd like you to listen. But he was sad. At the word, verse 22. And went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He came to Jesus. He knelt down. He ran. He, 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 he did not follow the norm of being a wealthy person. And he, he, he said to Jesus that he was good enough, that he kept his commandments. But he left the presence of Jesus sorrowful because he had a lot, many possess- possessions. Friends, if your possessions possesses you, that's covetousness. We should possess things, not the things possesses us. What does he want from Jesus? He wants information. I could preach here academically or brilliantly or whatever it is. It's all about information. But if that does not change my heart, your heart, friends, I'm just wasting my time. The fourth group of people are those who were with Jesus for three and almost a half years. Let me go straight to verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. There you go, the, the, where the, the anchor of my sermon comes from. We want you to do. Can't you see, Jesus? We left everything. We left our families. We left our homes. You see, Peter was saying, you see the boat? The boat was a symbol of their business. Without the boat, they cannot fish. You see, Jesus, the boat? We left everything for you. What do we get? 
And you're saying if the rich young ruler will not be saved, who could be saved? Because they had the understanding during the time that when you're rich, you're favored by God, you're blessed by God. And if you're poor, you're on the opposite spectrum. And so if the rich young ruler who is perceived to be blessed by God could not be saved, then how could be saved? And then Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but with God it is possible. Meaning to say, with men, change is not going to happen, but with God, change is possible. Whew. Did you catch it? What are you struggling right now? Your addiction? Your anger? You're struggling with your discussion and debate and verification with your wife or your husband or your children? What are you struggling? And you, you're praying, Lord, change me. Our words without faith could not change us because it's only God who can change us. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? You know, in my prayer life, I, for the past two weeks, I've been, I've been on my, on the side of my bed, you know, this is the bed. I'll be on the side. I'll open the church hymnal. Just illustrate. I'll open the church hymnal and I'll sit. And I will read the Bible and I will pray. Lord, today, that was during my prayer time. I will not ask anything from you. All I want is give me more faith. So that has been my prayer for the past two weeks. More faith, more hope, more love. If I hear difficult situation in the church, let me not be so stressed. Just, just help me to have more faith in you. And besides, I cannot solve the problem. You alone can solve the problem. I'm just here to facilitate. I'm here to be a, a holding area for those people who are going through difficult times. Because you're the only one who could heal the person who's dying. You could only heal the person who has cancer. You could, you're the only one who could heal broken relationships inside the church. So I say, God, I'm not asking for anything else. Not even Christmas gifts. Not even... I, uh, let, sorry. You don't need to give gifts to me. You give it to somebody else who is poor. I'm asking, Lord, that I have more faith in you. What do you want? What do they want from Jesus? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. What does the disciple want? What do the disciples want? They want position. They want compensation in the kingdom of God. The Pharisees want verification. The children want benediction. The rich young ruler in the three gospels want information. The disciples want compensation. That's why they are near Jesus during that time. The last group, which is represented by this fellow by the name of Bartimaeus. I'm now in verse 46. And from Judea on the road, going to Jerusalem, now they're on their way to Jericho. Important places in the Bible. Now they came to Jericho. There are two Jerichos before in, in, the, in Israel right now. There are the, the ruins, the old one, the ruins, and the new one, which is built by Herod. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great mega multitude blind Bartimaeus. That's in Hebrew. That's... Uh, Son of Timaeus. And it was repeated here. The son of Timaeus sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus of the son of David. That's a messianic term. Have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rab Rabboni, that's dear Rabbi, that's a, a sacred uh, a sacred, endearing address. 
that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. I love this. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Guess where? On the road. All right? And our journey is complete. Let me just squeeze some juice. As we marinate our minds and our hearts from Judea all the way to Jerusalem, he passed by there. He told his disciples that he will be crucified, mocked, spit upon, and he will be treated. He will be betrayed, treated badly. And then they went up to Jericho. They, they met this Bartimaeus. In the Gospel of Matthew, there were two blinds that, 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 that narrates to us the same story in the Gospel of Luke, only one. But the whole story points us to this to this contrast that the disciples were with Jesus. Their eyes were open, but they did not recognize who Jesus was in that stage before the crucifixion. But blind Bartimaeus, and he was blinded because of some circumstance difficult. He was able to just hear. And I'd like you to understand the eight steps to Christ that he did. Eight steps to Christ. He begged. Martin Luther said he was a beggar of Christ in his prayer. I beg for mercy. Do you beg? He begged. He heard. He cried. He threw away. He he rose up. He came to Jesus. He received Jesus. And he followed Jesus. Eight simple steps that we as Christians, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians can follow. That we can be like this man who may not have the physical blindness, but we are spiritually blind. You know, I have to admit, I'm also spiritually blind. All I can do is just like Bartimaeus, beg Hear Jesus. Cry. Throw away. Rose up. Come to Jesus. Receive Him. And follow Jesus on the road. The road is a symbol of what... It is a symbol. It's, it's a place where you live. It's a place where you do your... Where you, 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 you take to, to go to your work. And a place where you visit people. And the road... Is your way of life. On that road is your way of life. And there are going to be many circumstances and challenges and changes. But you are not alone because you're following Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, friends, guess, guess what I'm trying to say here. When you follow Jesus, you will be healed from your spiritual and physical blindness. What does Bartimaeus want from Jesus? He wants to be transformed. From being blind to a man who could see. What do you want from Jesus? Do you want verification of the truth? Empirical data? Just like the Pharisees? Do you want to come to Jesus because you want to be blessed and and be spoken of that you are the son or daughter or a child of the Most High God? Do you come to Jesus because you just want information? You, You wanted to withhold to keep all your possessions with you and not to be not to be bothered to sell give and follow Jesus or do you want to be like the disciples they were meritorious they were, they they followed Jesus they gave up everything but they want compensation they want position or you want to be like Bartimaeus who wants to be transformed Church, I want to be transformed by Jesus. I want my possession to be my character. I'm not there yet, friends. I'm far away from the road. But if people are are mean or irritating or annoying, likewise me to them, I try to reflect and say, you know what? I'm not following the road. I'm not following the road, the way of Jesus. Let me allow myself to pray and be transformed by the renewing of my mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So there's adjustment. There's adjustment. What do you want from Jesus? Why are you here? What do you want from Jesus, friends? So today, as we journey together, I 
I told the uh, his daily newspaper when they interviewed me. I speak well about the what we're going, uh, what's going on here. I said, Christmas is about giving. When we give our hearts to the Lord, we will be changed. Amen. What do you really want from Christ? Do you want to be changed by your encounter with Jesus? Is that your desire, friends, today? You hear the word and you rise up. You came. You come to the foot of the cross. You receive the special blessings by faith. And then you follow Jesus. Amen? Isn't that why we are here? Come on, church. Speak to me today. What do you really want from Jesus? What I want is that Jesus will be my companion and will say to me, even if I mess things up, Mark, I still love you. Just walk with me. Just walk with me. Even if I messed up, I don't need to feel the guilt. I had to cast it to the Lord and be a changed person. Amen? And be a transformed person just like Bartimaeus. Would you like that today, friends, as you encounter Jesus? I'd like to make this altar call or invitation. Those of you who like to follow the cross in your journey towards heaven, and you wanted to change specific things in your heart or attitude or, or your, your just desire for more stuff or, or your debating attitude or your whatever attitude that is, would you like to say, Jesus, I'd like to give this up to you and become transformed by your presence. Would you like to dare and say, Pastor, I'd like to follow Jesus. Would you like to make that stand with me? Would you like to make that stand? Only Jesus knows your heart. There are specific things. Maybe I'm a nugger. Maybe I say negative words. Yeah. Lord, this before the year ends, I pray and I ask for faith that you can transform me. That with you, nothing is impossible. That I, that I could be changed. My temperament, Lord, I'm struggling. My, my anger issues, I'm struggling. My irritating, I have a debilitating disease, Lord. If you are there, stand with me today. I want Jesus to change my life. I want Jesus to give me his faith. I want Jesus to be the Lord. The Lord of my life. That when I say hallelujah and raise my hands, I am free because I have a relationship with Jesus. No matter what people say or do to me, I have a relationship with Jesus. Amen and amen.